thank you. Um, everyone can hear me in the back? It's good, okay. So, hello, I'm, I'm Bjarni. I'm a free software hacker from Iceland. Um, I met uh, one of your organizers, Richard, at PyCon uh, UK, and we were chatting. He asked me to come and tell some stories about what I've been doing in the last few years. Because uh, since about 2010, I've been trying to make, my, make free software my full-time job. And I haven't done this by getting employed by a big company. So I've been trying to figure out how to do it myself. Some success, but I have some stories to tell. Uh, I'm not an expert. Um, this, I don't have a book to sell or, or anything, but um, I have some stories. You can learn from my mistakes, maybe. Um, for the purpose of this talk, I'm going to be talking about free software. You can imagine that I said open source every time I use the term free software. They're mostly the same. Um, I use the word, the term free software because I care about the freedom and the politics and the ideals, all the stuff that the open source term was invented to sort of de-emphasize. Um, but why would you care? You know, why would you want to go and make free software the focus of your career? And in my case, it was actually, it really goes back to what Nick was talking about earlier. I discovered free software very early in my career, and my career is to a great degree thanks to free software. Um, I got my first programming job uh, when I was 16, and I was writing accounting programs in C. Now, not a good idea. Don't hire 16-year-olds to write your accounting programs in C. Just don't need to tell you that. Hire them in, to do it in Python instead. But I learned a lot, and I discovered that I really wanted to be a system administrator, because that was that cool guy who ran all the computers, and he had root, and you know, he was boss. So I wanted to be him. I went and I downloaded Slackware Linux, and put on a stack of floppies, and took over the PC at home, and I taught myself to be a sysadmin. And that was it. You know, since then, I've been doing system administration and software development as a job. And I want others to be able to do the same thing. And I want to be kind of like those cool guys that gave me these tools at an impressionable young age. I'm still trying to be as cool as they are. And also, computing is kind of important for society. We don't want the code and the infrastructure that runs how we communicate and how we work to be proprietary. So free software and open source is a very important thing. So can it be a full-time job? Um, these days, the answer is yes, of course. Um, most of us probably use some free software at work. Uh, some of us get paid to write free software. If you're working for a large business, then that's become relatively common. I think most open source and, and free software projects are written by people at work. It's not hobbyists doing all of this. But the tricky bit and the answer becomes no when you have a project and you say, hey, I like this project. Someone should pay me. And that brings me to this beautiful image, putting the cart before the horse. If you already have the project and you already have this idea of what you want to do, you, there's a lot of things that you don't know. You don't know whether anyone is willing to pay for that. You don't know who they are. You know, if someone's willing to pay for it, who are they? And you don't know how much they're going to pay. And because you're a software developer, you probably don't really care. You're not a marketing guy. You're not a business guy. You're a hacker. So the other question you don't know is you don't know if you're solving the right problem. So you might be solving your problem. You don't know if anyone else likes the solution or has the same problem. So I've tried this um, three times so far in my career. And we're here to laugh at my mistakes or learn from them or something. These are the strategies that I've tried. Um, strategy number one was to apply for a job and have someone create the job that I wanted to do. Strategy number two is selling stuff, selling services, selling licenses, consulting, contracting, you know, sell people stuff they'll pay for. Strategy three, get a grant. That's when you find someone that has too much money and you ask them to give it to you for no good reason. Strategy four is the same, except you ask the entire internet to give you money. And that's, that works for a different class of projects. There are some projects that you can crowdfund. There are others that you can get grants for. They don't necessarily overlap a lot. And then there's the option five, is to retire. Or 
And I, I mean, that, that's, that's sort of an exaggerated example. But if you are in a position where you're well paid at your job, and you can get away with working three days a week, that means you can spend two days doing whatever you like. So this is, this is one way that you can fund developing software that you care about, but you don't necessarily know how to find a market for. Is you can just have a day job a few days a week or a few months a year, take some time off, do the things you care about. So the first example, and I apologize, it's Perl code. But uh, I did say I was going to talk about some mistakes I made. So this is my haircut when I wrote this code. Um, <laughs> So this was uh, 1998. I started working on this. <coughs> Excuse me. It was a security filter for email. So it was a tool that would take your email and it would rewrite it to avoid certain exploits that mail clients were vulnerable to, to strip out executable attachments so that you wouldn't get a virus. And I decided after a while, you know, I've been doing this for a few years for fun. I thought, hey, this could be a job. And I was lucky enough that in Reykjavik, uh, my hometown, there was an antivirus company. Does anyone here remember FProt Antivirus? Yes, some people, some people. They're, they're an Icelandic company, or were, and they were based uh, three minutes from my house, walking. So I, I walked to their offices. Uh, at the time, I was not just rocking that haircut, I also had a top hat and leather pants, you know, I was doing the goth thing. And I said, hey, why don't you hire me to create an email security service? So that's strategy two, I was, except I was asking them to take the risk. They would create, the, they would take care of selling it, they had the reputation, they had the missing pieces needed to take my solution and turn it into a product. And it worked. We, we built an email security service where we would scan email for businesses. At the high point, we had two different national ISPs sending all of their emails through our code. The low point is when we lost an entire nation's email for 24 hours. That was not a good day. <laughs> but um, this was not actually a success story from the point of view of making free software my full-time job. Because you know, although I did find an employer that needed my skills and was willing to let me work on the things I wanted to do, uh, they had the things I needed. We found people to pay for the product. I didn't end up writing a lot of free software. I ended up mostly writing proprietary code that was kept inside the business and has not been released to this day. And the open source code that I arrived with, you know, the free software project that I was passionate about, it languished because I was too busy doing my job. And so that's the risk of this strategy, is that if someone's paying you a salary, you have a job to do and you have to do that. But it was a, it was a good, good attempt. The other lesson that I learned there was that the code that I had written was not solving the right problem. It was not solving a problem that people, in a way that people were happy with. So this is, and this is something that you only get when you have a bunch of users. When users are telling you their experience of using your software, that's when you really know whether you created something good or not. And in this case, Anomie was actually not very good. It just confused the users. They were like, why has my email been rewritten? That's frustrating. So second story, um, this fast forward to yeah, 2010. This is called PageKite. This is what it looks like on the command line. PageKite is a proxy solution that makes it easy for you to run a website on your laptop or on a home computer without reconfiguring your router. So there's a, there's a, service, a, a relay server or a proxy that runs somewhere in the cloud. You run a client that connects to it, and traffic flows back and forth. And I created this because I was concerned about um, personal privacy of data, and I thought that social networking was important. I was afraid of Facebook, and I still am. Uh, how many people here know about Diaspora? Okay, so this was about the same time. Diaspora was a brilliant idea. It was you were going to make this thing that worked just like Facebook, but you could run it yourself. The trouble is that they never really considered how hard it is to run something by yourself at home. And PageKite was supposed to fill the gap. It was supposed to be the bridge from the software running on your Raspberry Pi to the internet and not require that you learn to be a sysadmin and reconfigure your router. Um, I made this, I founded a company around this idea. Uh, 
the idea was to sell services and support, in particular to provide relays on the internet that people would pay for access to. And I got a grant. So this was strategies two and three from my list. Uh, the high point so far, I had three or four employees, depending on how you count. Um, unfortunately, the low point is I had them all writing code that I ended up never using because I'm a terrible manager. Um, report card for this, again, from the point of view of making free software my job. We did a good job releasing everything. Almost all of the code that I've written in this venture is open and on GitHub. We did manage to get a grant, and this was not some idealistic grant. It wasn't an NGO, it was a, a government grant. So in Iceland, the, you can get a grant for developing a new business. And I'm pretty sure Icelanders didn't invent that concept, so there may be such things that you can apply for here. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about grants towards the end. Um, we did find a market. It turns out that the Internet of Things, where people are building small gadgets that you plug in in your home, it's really useful to have a web server in those, and it's really useful for that web server to be reachable without the consumer having to know anything about their network. So I'm now selling technology to businesses that are shipping devices to people's homes. And a lot of the time, they're shipping Python code. So that's growing. Um, failures, I waste a lot of money. The market that I thought I was going for and the problem that I wanted to solve, the, the social networking thing, that never happened. Um, that still hasn't happened. Maybe it will. Uh, don't know. But um, it's still a going concern. It's most of, it's maybe 20% of my time is still working on PageKite and I'm still developing new features. Uh, third project, again different. This is a project called MailPile, which has been my most popular attempt. Um, this I started with three friends, uh, two friends, sorry, or three of us, who met in a hot tub in Reykjavik. We crowdfunded on Indiegogo. We went to Indiegogo and we pitched to the internet, hey, you should be able to run your own Gmail at home and you should be able to easily encrypt your email. And we timed this completely by accident, so we went live with the crowdfunding campaign the same summer as Edward Snowden told everyone what the NSA had been up to. So people cared a lot about privacy. It was also the same summer that LavaBit went out of business because they wouldn't give their encryption keys to the US government. So there was a lot of press about privacy and security, and that translated into a lot of people throwing money at MailPile. So we raised enough money to pay for two developers to work full time for a year and a half. Um, we also applied for some grants. And here, crickets, we've gotten no grants, even if it's a project that a lot of people like. Um, and strategy five is the retire option because we ran out of money without shipping a 1.0, which is, again, software, managing software projects is hard. I'm still working on this, but right now I'm paying for it out of my own pocket. High point was, of course, when Cory Doctorow said we were cool. Um, this is unfinished, so I'm not giving myself a grade. Again, we managed to release all of our code as free software, so this is, there's no proprietary side to MailPile. Um, the timing was good, we raised a lot of money, that was all really cool, we got a lot of attention, and we actually, as a result, have a community. And that's one of the best things about crowdfunding, is that it gets you attention. Um, people know about your project, they want to take part, they invest money, if they're willing to invest money, maybe they're willing to send a patch or two or some bug reports. Uh, failures, no grants. We don't know how to get grants for this software, apparently. Um, project management, at first we didn't think we needed project management, we just wrote some code. When we realized that we, were, that we needed some project management, we were out of time. So we actually ran out of money before we shipped a, a 1.0 that our backers could use. And if I have backers in the audience here, I apologize, still working on it. Um, so what lessons have been learned from, from this? Uh, just a few sort of concrete things that you can take with you. Grants are hard. Um, when I've succeeded in getting grants, it's because, well, the main success was when I applied for a business development grant to develop a business. And that sounds redundant and it sounds like a tautology, but it's actually a key point that I was applying for a grant to do the thing that the funder wanted me to do. Whereas with MailPile, when we applied to NGOs and we asked them for money, 
we went to them and we said, hey, look, MailPile is awesome. This is this beautiful concept. We're really great. You should give us some of your money. And that's not what they wanted. They, when people have foundations and are offering money, they do so for a reason. They have a goal, and they want you to solve their problem. So you can't just go to a grant, a, a funder, and say, I have a cool project. You have to go to a funder and say, I am going to solve the problem you have. Uh, so it is, in many ways, much more, it's like getting a job or, or selling a product in that respect. So trying to learn this lesson, maybe I'll try again sometime. Uh, crowdfunding is the new kid on the block. It's very exciting. Uh, the pros to crowdfunding your work is that you have complete freedom. If you present an idea that people like, you can get almost anything funded. Of course, this means you have to be good at some sort of marketing. You have to have a group of people that you can reach out to and communicate, get them motivated, and get them excited. And, and that's easier said than done. Uh, I got lucky that I had one of the team members on MailPile was very good at videos and visual communication, so that helped. But mostly we got lucky. Mostly Edward Snowden did our marketing for us. Um, crowdfunding allows you to do things for the general public. It's very easy to, to find a job writing a software development tool or a library that is used at that job or is used by other businesses. It's hard to get funding to build the next Firefox. Or actually, Firefox has a pretty clear business model. But maybe something like LibreOffice, which doesn't have ads and doesn't have a clear business model, that's a project of that nature is much more hard to get corporations to pay for. So if you can convince the general public that you're writing software that they want, crowdfunding may be an interesting solution to that. The cons, of course, the downside is that when you crowdfund, you get a fixed amount of money, and then that's gone. So you, if you want your project to be sustainable financially, you have to do all of that work within that time frame that you're given. Um, also, most crowdfunding campaigns ship rewards. They ship t-shirts or pens or USB sticks or physical devices in many cases. And I've seen a lot of crowdfunding campaigns f sort of fail to account for the costs of that. Or conversely, they fail to account for the costs of their own salaries. Now, software developers get, are well paid until they start working for themselves, because usually they don't know how to value their work. And I see this again and again with crowdfunding. I, there was a very nice, you know, it was a good project. Uh, some French guys that wanted to do uh, an email in a box hardware solution. And they were, I think they were asking for like 70,000 euro or something. And that was supposed to be for the hardware and the development for who knows how many months, for two people. I mean, these guys were going to work for less than minimum wage under a lot of stress on a complex problem. And, and that's not realistic. We can't build our, our infrastructure that way. And when you have a successful crowdfunding campaign, you have thousands of people that have backed you, there's a little bit of pressure. You know, like, it's really embarrassing to be up on stage and say, well, you know, I kind of failed. I haven't shipped what I promised I would ship. And I felt really bad about that for a while. Um, but when you have a large group of people that have backed you, uh, in my experience, communicating honestly, you know, publishing work as it's, you know, not when it's beautiful, just publish it. Release the code immediately. Document things, write blog posts, go to events and talk to people so they know that you're working on it. And they will forgive you if you fail for a legitimate reason. Um, and failure is very likely because project management is hard. So, End this on a positive note. Just do it. Um, if you have an idea that you would like to turn into a business, give it a try. But if you have an idea and you don't know how to turn it into a business, write it anyway. You know, not all projects have to be jobs. It's really hard to predict what will work and what won't. And if you're scratching your own itch, probably someone else has the same itch. Um, sort of a spin on my strategy number five of retiring is, is to take a holiday. You know, take a break, go somewhere, write some code, learn a new skill, and that can lead to an entire new job, an entire new career, even if it's not exactly the project that you started on. So go out and write some code, and good luck. So I'm hoping that that triggered some questions. I, I rushed through that a little bit so we'd have time to talk.
Okay, uh, so let's start with the first question from Daniel. Which open source software license do you prefer? That's a good question. Um, from an idealistic point of view, I prefer the GPL family of licenses, but I'm strategic about it. So if you are trying to create a new standard, like say an image format or a network protocol, using a liberal license is the right choice because you want people to adopt your standard and use your technology almost no matter what context. Um, on the other hand, if you are building uh, some sort of network service where you want to be able to run a business on the side, something like the GPL, a strict copyleft license, actually gives you more business options because then you have the option of dual licensing and offering people a proprietary license if they are allergic to the GPL. If you go with a liberal license from the very start, you won't have that option. Um, the other thing that uh, GPL licenses do is they create sort of a, a common playing field. Uh, everyone is playing by the same rules. No one gets a big head start by keeping, by releasing some things and keeping some things private. So it really depends on the project. And uh, like in the case of MailPile, we actually, we didn't know. Because on the one hand, we wanted lots of people to use it. We, we knew that the GPL would be controversial in many circles. Uh, so we considered, to begin with, we licensed it, licensed it under the Apache license. And we also licensed it under the AGPL. So we had both licenses on the same code base. And then we asked our community to vote. And we had people vote on which license they preferred. It turned out that they didn't really care. Uh, like 80 or 90% of the people just didn't bother to vote. The few that did, I think we had 51% for the GPL and 49 point something for the Apache license. So I ended up making the call. You know, we, we talked about it in the, t in the core team. And I ended up saying this project should be an AGPL license project because this project is about freedom specifically. It's specifically about user users being independent and autonomous and owning their data. So using a license that is a little bit hostile to people that want to build proprietary software was the right choice in that case. But it's a, it's a tough call. OK. Uh, so one next one, quite interesting question. If given a second chance, what would you have done differently to have been able to ship MailPile 1.0 in time? Project management of some sort. Um, we did a very typical thing where we sort of flailed about and wrote interesting code because a year seemed like a really long time. We wanted to ship something within a year. And you know, next year is really far away. But once you've done, after you've done that for six months and you suddenly realize, wait a minute, how do people install this thing? It can take another six months just to figure out what your installation and setup story is. And it turned out that that needed more than six months. We weren't able to get it done in time. Um, so I think that if I were starting over, I would probably prioritize things very differently. I would prioritize being able to get people up to speed so that people could install the software right away even if it was in a poor state, and then start adding all of the interesting security email features. But it's just difficult. Realistic, I think, honestly, there was no way we were ever going to get that done in a year because it's just a big project. And so we should have asked for more time, and we should have asked for more money. I don't know if we would have gotten it. OK, uh, so next one. What will be the future of MailPile? 1.0. <laughs> now the future is to, the next, the next goal that I have in mind is to ship something that is easy to install and use on the Linux platform. So we, are, for those of you unfamiliar with the project, we, our main goal is to ship a desktop client, something people can run on Windows, run on the Mac, something that they can use, uh, something that the end user can use, like the Firefox for email. But we aren't going to get there in one jump. We, we did try. We had, for a while, we had a Windows version and a Mac version and a Linux version. And we discovered the platform integration, you know, making sure that the metaphors of the OSX desktop are adhered to. We didn't do that. We just
got something to run, and users were confused. They couldn't figure out how to start the program or stop the program. So we're postponing that. We just wanted to get the basics out there so that our community can at least install it on a Raspberry Pi or on their Linux machine. And then once that's starting to stabilize, then we'll move on to the desktop platforms. So still working. We do still have sort of a roadmap and a plan. OK, so now the question about some psychological aspects. So how do you manage stress? How do you prevent burnouts? What keeps you motivated? Uh, Failed at that too. Had a bit of a burnout last summer and the summer before that. It's really hard. Um, and this is one of the risks, this is one of the main risks of being sort of self employed is it's not a day job that you just go to and then you go home in the evening. You're always at work. And I don't have an easy answer. But take a vacation, do something else. Um, sometimes. What, I, what I've done is I've just gone and written something else. I've taken a break from these projects and I've written, worked on some side project because I love to code and exploring some other project for a couple of weeks. It makes me feel guilty, but it, it recharges my batteries. So if anyone has good ideas, please share them with me afterwards. I could use some help here. OK. Was there someone who stole your open source idea? Who stole? Who stole, yes. That even possible? Um, I don't know. I don't think so. Um, I've, I've seen one instance where there were some striking similarities between the feature set that Ngrok offered and what PageKite was doing. And they started a fair bit later. So I'm, I do hope that they took some inspiration from what I was doing. But I'm not going to say that they stole the idea. It's an, it, once you're working on that kind of problem, it's an obvious solution. OK, so kind of similar question. What to do in case someone takes your open source project, rebrands it, and starts selling it, violating its license in process? Are you asking, uh, is this, if this is a question about how I enforce my licenses, I haven't been in that situation yet, so I don't know. I would probably contact the FSFE or the FSF and ask for help, um, or the Software Freedom well, there's, there's, there are organizations that can help with this sort of thing. SFLC. Software Freedom Conservancy. Software Freedom Conservancy for the people in the stream. Um, but yeah, I, at the moment, I just don't worry about it. And this is one of the advantages to using a liberal license is that you've just given people permission and you don't care. Uh, that's what I'm doing with the more recent uh, PageKite developments is the the uh, second generation of that code is just under an Apache license. People can use it for whatever. Um, with MailPile, I'd be very surprised if someone tried to steal that and embed it, because it would be so obvious. Uh, OK, so we have two minutes left. Uh, the next question, how did the we lost a day's worth of email thing went down? <laughs> um, Luckily, we were bouncing the emails, so the senders did get error messages. So they at least knew that they could, should resend. It wasn't just into a black hole. But yeah, I think our clients were unhappy. And this is one of the benefits to working for a business that had other employees, that there, were, there was a marketing guy that could talk to them. <laughs> uh, I mean, mistakes happen. And uh, it was embarrassing, but it, we didn't lose the contract. They stayed with us for a while longer after that. I think when we eventually lost the contract, it was just because of some of the problems I mentioned before, that it wasn't a good fit for what people wanted. Rewriting people's emails is confusing. OK, so one last question, um, because we're running out of time. Uh, have you ever localized a program into Icelanding? Oh, yes. Um, I worked on translating KDE went back in the 1.1 days, and uh, also did, done a little bit of work on, on Red Hat. For a while, I was spinning my own Red Hat distribution and mailing it to people in Iceland. So I made sure that it had translations, and I did some of the translations myself. MailPile has, is mostly translated into Icelandic. Um, I think internationalization is really important, because Iceland is a tiny community. It's 300,000 people. If we want our software to be in our language, we have to do it ourselves. 
And this is one of the values that free software provide, offers to smaller nations, is that they can be independent with their computing without having to invent everything themselves. So, so yes, it's, and it's a great way to get started on an open source as a contributor, because you can just sort of read through the code, you can try and understand it, you can translate to your language, and uh, it's a very valuable contribution. Okay, time is up, so thank you for your talk.